<laughs> I know it's like already there. I didn't even know what day it was, so apologies. Um, I just posted on Blackboard. I'll go ahead and share the screen so y'all can see this. Um, the take home portion of it. I typically try to give you a week for it. So if you need more time, um, you know, to do it, let me know. But the other um, thing with this. is um, doing the take home will help you study for the in-class portion. Mm -hmm. So I'd recommend if you can get it done by Monday, trying to do that. And for the take home, um, I've traditionally had people turn them in in class. Um, so uh, you can either print it out and write on it, or you can type on it and write on it. Um, and nope, don't want updates, ask me later. So it's just three short essays for 15 points each. Um, so the first one is about the history of assessment. The second one is a, let me move this bad boy, there we go. A ethical vignette where you get to say what Dr. Oops did wrong. Um, <laughs> and then the third one, is about reliability and validity. So essentially there's one essay for each of our uh, chapters. And in terms of like the amount of space, again, traditionally I've given these um, where I'll like physically hand them out to you. So you can uh, just sort of assume that the amount of space on the paper would be enough. Although if you're someone who writes more and you need more room, that's fine. Um, the biggest thing is to pay attention to where the points breakdown is and make sure you talk about each part. So for example, if you miss talking about cross-cultural fairness on essay three, that would have to be automatically minus five just because you're not covering the material, right? So just make sure you're covering each of those. I basically start everything for everyone at a perfect score. And then I just take points away. I think there are professors who do the opposite, like a research to a zero, and then like maybe you might earn a grade. I don't believe in that mm -hmm. philosophy. Maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> I think you all like know stuff, right? And I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. So um, yeah, that is where we are with that. Questions about the take home portion. So we're going to try having you all print it out and turn it in in person on Monday. Um, and again, if you need more time, that's okay too. Um, if that feels yucky to us, right, um, then I can, for the second one, make it, the, there's a blackboard place. You could turn it in and you can either scan it if you handwrite it, or you could just upload it. Yeah. Yeah, yep. So this is the take home exam, which is due on Monday in theory. I'm going to give you some extra time because usually I try to give you a week to do it. So you have the take home portion that you do. And then in class, we'll have a shorter one that is some multiple choice and some short answers, basically. Are we going to do a review on that? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, I could definitely dedicate some time on Friday for that, for sure. Isn't it open? What's that? Isn't it open? Uh, no. <laughs> The women's, women's and gender sex one. So that might be what you're thinking about. <laughs> yeah. So the in class portion is closed, no closed book, which is another reason why doing the take home portion might be helpful to sort of get some of the info in there. So, yeah, I will um, set some time aside on Friday as a come with questions about, you know, material that we've covered. So, again, it is. Um, the sort of history of assessment, ethical and legal issues, and then the validity and reliability chapter that we're still covering right now. And that's what will be covered. Already, any other questions about it? You'll have the full class period for the exam. Um, there's no one in this classroom after us, so if you need to go over work, you can, but it's certainly written such that you can finish it within the time, for sure, for sure. So. Let me go ahead and get our captions going here. Um, there we go. 
Alrighty, and we had been talking about what are all the various things that can influence um, the observed scores, right? Make the observed scores different than the true scores, either higher or lower. Um, and we were thinking about, you know, an exam you might take in class. And we had talked about some stuff with the test itself and the test taker, including, you know, anxiety, things along those lines. Uh, and the test environment we had like just started to get into. So what are some other things about the test environment that might influence how well someone does or not? I think we mentioned it before, but uh, the seat placement. So, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, depending on where you sit, in proximity of other people will determine exactly how well or how poorly you do. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that might be better for some people, worse for others, right? Definitely. Some people, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, I think also, uh, oh, yeah. We would do that in my lab classes in high school where we have like dividers. So you kind of have your own space at the left table to take the test. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Right. I don't know if this makes sense, but like the clock, sometimes it like makes you like if you're staring at it, you like, oh, I'm running out of time. So it makes you like rush or you be like, oh, just like, you know, so I feel like the clock sometimes when you're watching it, that's like a, you know. Yeah, that, that is sort of like always a question for me because like when I teach in social science lab 111, the big classroom over here, there's no clock in there. And so on exams, it's like, in the past, I've like put a clock up on the like projector, and I don't know if that makes it better or worse for people. Or right? sometimes I'll just like announce, like, okay, you are halfway through essentially, you have half the time left. So, yeah, I think you all have some really good points there, right? And you know, for folks who do have learning differences or attention differences, right, being in a quiet individual setting, you know, sort of the a uh, more extreme version of what we were just talking about becomes very vital, right? But for folks who don't need that, sometimes that can be like disconcerting, right? So like when people have to take take home or makeup exams from me, I often send them to the learning center to do it. And like being in a room by yourself to get an exam might be feel really weird to some folks who are not used to that, right? All right, how about the scoring of the test or the grading of the test? Yeah, we know. I know some of you said you didn't have to take it. Um, but when I took the SAT, there was a section that didn't count. It was like an experimental section. Like they were figuring out one for that. It's like, I get that. But like, why are you making <laughs> every single one of us do it? Like, let us volunteer to do it or something, right? Because it's another 45 minutes or whatever of our time. Um, yeah, you made me think of actually when you take the GRE. So the GRE, the way it's given, is on a computer and it's adaptive. So as you get more questions right, it starts giving you harder questions. But that means as you get more questions wrong, it gives you easier questions. So you can like tell when you're doing poorly. <laughs> so that's like both grading and test environment, right? And one, yeah, I remember I had a bad cold when I took my GRE and they're so strict, they wouldn't even let me take tissues <laughs> with me. I don't know if they thought I was like write something on the tissues or whatever, but I was like, all right. Your computer is going to have the snot on it. I mean, today, this day and age, I just have a mask on, right? But that was not a thing back in the 90s, or not the 90s, but early 2000s. So, other things about scoring. Well, I actually think it's a lot of like how we score, like what they're asking for. 
Right. Right, right. And that's why, like, I just showed you all on my take homes. I try to be really clear about, like, if you don't mention this, you're going to lose points so that you're not guessing. I remember when I was sitting for the OSAC, mm -hmm. um, one of the early systems where it has to be swore the test differently, depending on like how hard your test happens to be. Right. And that's just what you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think you all are being very generous right now in terms of <laughs> professors or teachers, right? We all, all the stuff we talked about with test takers can come into play for the people who are grading it too, right? So like if I give you an exam and I'm grading it on a day where I'm just having a crappy day, right? Sometimes I have to stop myself and be like, I'm not being fair right now, right? And I go back to it when I feel it a little bit better. Or if professors are tired, there have been times I mismarked answers as wrong when they were. So if I ever do that to you, please come up and tell me. I always tell people, if I do it in the opposite way and give you credit where you shouldn't have, like you don't need to tell me, I might just take that point, right? <laughs> um, because that was my bad, but I don't want to punish you for my tired mess. Yeah. And so we can have the same type of thing. Um, all four exams like the LSAT, the SAT, the GRE. So Dr. Jackson each summer will help to grade AP psych exams and they have essays on them. And they just sit in a room and grade essays for eight hours a day. Like it sounds like my personal hell, but he loves it. Like he's like, yeah, I like make competitions with myself to see how fast I can go. And like they have a very clear rubric, so it's easy to do it. But like I just like go. <laughs> I like to give like time to each student and like think it through, right? So again, it just depends on what is the formatting, what are they looking for, that type of thing. How is the person who's scoring doing? Uh, can be a big piece of it as well. All right. So as we said before, you have this variation in the true score and based on the error. There's many, many, many reasons for variation in those observed score. So again, the true score is what we would hope we could get on the ideal testing conditions, right? what that person actually knows. Um, but there's going to be variation in how much students know if we're still using the exam example. So there's going to be true score variation, right? So even if I wrote the perfect test, scored it perfectly, you all were in your perfect mindset on that day in the perfect environment, there would still be differences among you all. Right? That's true score variation. And there are lots of things that have nothing to do with how much you know, and that's the error. That's all the non-perfect stuff, right, that we've just talked about. Variation in observed test for observed test scores, there we go, reflects both the true score variation and the error variation. Because again, you all could have different amounts of error even though you're taking the same test, right? Maybe one of you had to be up all night with a friend, right? And so you're more tired than other people in the room. Or maybe one of you has a doctor's appointment right afterwards and so you're like, I gotta get done so I can get to front time, right? All those things are gonna come into play. And you would hope there won't be that type of variation in error from professors. This is actually why I have your name on like the first page of the exam and nowhere else. Because once I'm past a few multiple choice questions, I turn it over and I don't know who's test this is. So that I can try to be as objective as possible, particularly when I get to like the essays and things that are more, the short answers that are more subjective. So, and again, those things vary from professor to professor. Like in grad school, they actually often had us only write our name like on the back of the back page so that they wouldn't see it till the end um, for the same reasons because it would only be like 10 or 12 of us in a class right they'd get to know us pretty quickly and often they'd have us in multiple classes it's just like we have you all here so this is that same formula that we looked at before now it can come back to uh, back into play so the central question of reliability is what 
proportion of the variation in the observed test scores, the actual grade distribution that will, you all will have on your exams after you take them next Monday, for example, can be attributed to or explained by the error variation, right? Versus the true score variation. And again, because we can never really perfectly get at the true score, right? We just don't have the ability to do that right now with the technologies we have. We kind of always have to guess, right? But we can know more about the error variation, right? And we certainly will know the observed score variation because I will have a distribution of grades that after I grade your exams, I'll be able to present to you. So there's a couple different examples here, right? So this might be the amount of variation in test A that can be accounted for by variation in the true score versus variation in error. And so only 10% error, great, awesome. Well, maybe test B, a separate test that a different professor written wrote for a different class, 35% of the variation in the observed score is actually made up for by error. Ooh, we don't quite want to have that much of our grade determined just by error, right? And so we need to be uh, pretty careful. I mean, just thinking about it, if you had the option to take test A or test B, which one would you rather take? Yeah, definitely, right? You want the one that's going to actually show what you know, not just how much error was there. So test A will show your knowledge more accurately. And that means test A is more reliable than test B because it's measure it better at measuring that true score variation. So if it's the proportion of true score variation to error variation, in addition to being something we could represent with a pie chart, uh, can also be represented as a reliability coefficient. Um, and this is essentially how much unreliability is in the measure. And it ranges from zero to one. So again, going back to our examples here, test A's reliability coefficient would be, I thought about it, which one, little mug is not going to do it, <laughs> 0.90, right? Because 90% of the variation in observed scores can be attributed to that true score variation, only 10% to that error variation. And so then taking that into account, what would the well, reliability coefficient, I don't know why I can't say that word, just reliability coefficient be for test B? Yeah, point is five, exactly. Right? So if this was, let's say, a clinical test we want to give to someone that's going to help determine a diagnosis or the course of their life, right? We better as heck be using something up here. And this is true. Most intelligence tests, personality tests, things that are used in clinical settings have a 0.9 or above. 0.65 is really even beyond the realm of what's acceptable to use in research. Usually we want it to be 0.7 or above. And so for that same reason, the professors, we should aim to make it higher than that as well, right? Um, and so you can do that by writing consistent test questions, questions that are, uh, gets a little more validity, but questions that are going to be asking what the students actually learn. Yeah. It just goes, this question zero to one. Oh. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. And really, I mean, it depends. So if they are like a K-12 teacher, they've gotten a decent amount of training in that. It doesn't mean they'll be perfect at it, obviously. 
right? Um, if they're a professor, they might have gotten zero training in teaching. I had one class in my six year graduate school career on how to teach. And I was lucky because a lot of people don't even get that. My favorite professor in college, and I think he happened to just be a good professor because of his personality, he was really outgoing and kind of dramatic. And so he could make class entertaining, right? But he said the first time he taught, he just had like a slip of paper in his departmental mailbox in grad school that said, this is the class you're teaching and this is the book you're teaching. So yeah, I think that there's probably a lot to that where there might be people who have never learned how to construct their class, right? I remember when I came to that one day in graduate school, one of the freshmen took the biggest complaint. And it was real embarrassing because these professors aren't teaching us. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's okay. You know, it's just that they're not teachers, they're professors. You know, it's like, you want to learn stuff, but you kind of have to meet them halfway. And it's not, I mean, it's their job to teach, but it's not their job to teach you. Yeah, and it depends on the type of institution you go to, right? So Wesleyan is a liberal arts institution, so we are focused on teaching, right? So if you come to a place like this, in theory, you're choosing it because you want to teach. I mean, that's certainly why I, I love teaching. Teaching is my favorite part of my job. Um, when I had my maternity leave, I was really glad and really happy to get to spend six months with my daughter before I came back. But I was so glad to be back because I realized that, like, not only is teaching my job, it's my calling. And that's pretty rare for anyone, much less professors. Because, as Eric said, like, and as my example sort of illustrated in graduate school, particularly if you're getting a PhD, your training is not to teach, your training is really to do research. Um, although, obviously, if you're in something that has an applied element like clinical psychology like me, you're also being trained to do therapy. Um, so we get that on top of everything else. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's a really good point that um, higher ed in particular, like the academy, academia, as we think of um, big universities, what we call research one R1 universities assumes that everyone who's in their grad program is going to go to that type of university as well. And that's not realistic for a couple reasons in this day and age, right? One is that um, people have different job goals. And particularly if you're coming from a program like mine, right, where it's clinical psychology, I mean, you had people going to 100% clinical jobs because that's what they wanted to do. Um, the second is that let's be honest, there's just not that many of those jobs out there, right? Particularly when there have been hiring freezes and job offers rescinded because the university didn't have money because of a pandemic, say. Or like, I was on the job market in 2009, 2010, um, and that was like right after the housing bubble burst, right? So like, it's hard to find any job, much less those like prestigious jobs, let's say. Um, so I think that in general, the academy should revise. And there are actually a lot of people with PhDs who are leaving academia partially for this reason. I mean, you can get paid a lot more in industry. Um, like let's say you're a chemist and you go to work for Dow Jones, right? You're gonna be making maybe twice what you can make as a professor, for example. So, um, but also there's just more jobs, right? So that's part of it as well. Yeah, and because I'm passionate about teaching, I have gone to teaching conferences, right? I do webinars, I do things that like constantly update me, but there are people who don't care, right? Or might only have to teach one class a year so they don't feel the, ne the need to hone their skills, whereas we teach three to four a semester. So it's much more important, yet much more integral part of our job. That was a little bit of philosophy on academia, uh, but I think it's important to think about just in terms of like who is creating these tests, right? It's created by academics, right? Um, and thinking about how in touch are they with the people that will ultimately give these tests. And again, some people might be great and they are on the ground giving these and they're giving these in diverse communities. And some people might be kind of like in their office in a bubble, right? 
And so that may be where some of that error comes into play as well, right, is with the test tree later. So if a test was all error, right, completely unreliable, then its coefficient would be zero. <laughs> if it was the perfect test, we were actually getting the true score, right, then it would be a one. It's rare to get either a zero or a one. We're typically mostly going to be in like the 0 0.5 to 0 0.95 range, somewhere in there. I have one questionnaire I used to measure body image. I didn't come up with it. It's existed for years. Um, that traditionally gets a reliability coefficient of like 0.96. And like for a questionnaire, that's almost unheard of. So that's why I keep using it. I'm like, it's good. I'm going to keep using it, right? So that is your reliability coefficient. We will see this reported if you look in um, journal articles where they talk about the measures they use. They'll say like the reliability coefficient or they'll call it alpha. Um, alpha looks like a Jesus fish. That's the description I have of it, right? It's like, or like a fancy A. Um, and alpha is the indication for uh, especially within test reliability, how much those items correlate with each other. The other thing we want to think about is that measurement error. Basically, when we talk about measurement error, we're talking about how much unreliability is there. And any factor that creates inaccuracy, inconsistency, error, right? can introduce what we call this measurement error. So a nice example to use for this um, is the 40 for football players. So who can tell me what that is, what that measures? How fast you can run in particular 40 yards, right? Yeah, 40 yards. And so it's supposed to approximate like how, run, how fast you would run on a play that was like a longer play, right? They have like running backs and other folks do it. Okay, so if we think about the 40, yeah, yeah, and remember these are on Blackboard too, so you can always print them or check them back later. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the examples of measurement error that we might run into on the 40. And again, we think of the 40 or other measures of speed or time as objectives, right? Like Oh, this is just like a pure measure. But there's a lot of things that can go into it. So um, there's actually studies that show the expectation of the person timing can influence it because they might hit it a little too fast, right? Before the person gets over the finish line because they expect them to be fast. Um, you know, obviously if you're using like a digital measurement system, some of that goes away. Um, People run faster on an artificial track um, rather than on the field, but often we're doing it on the field, right? Uh, people run faster in track shoes than football shoes, mostly because track shoes are made to make you go really fast, right? <laughs> or help you go really fast. Um, but oftentimes we're doing it in football shoes. But again, these are things you want to keep consistent across the players, right? So if you're testing 50, 100 players, you want to make sure all their their uh, conditions are similar or identical. Um, and often, if people are nervous, they run more slowly because it like expends energy in a different way. Although it can go the other way, and like that extra adrenaline can make you speed up. So I have done one relay triathlon in my life. I let two of my very physically fit friends talk me into it. Um, never again. I did the biking portion. <laughs> And I didn't have one of those fancy Lance Armstrong ways as much as a paper book bikes, right? I was on a mountain bike. And I remember like my fastest when I was in training was somewhere like 16 miles per hour. And like I looked down, like the first quarter mile of the race, and I was like, why am I going 22 miles an hour? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to like pace myself, right? So stuff like that can happen as well. And you see that at the Olympics, right? If you watch any of the track and field at the Olympics, there were some cases where people who you thought would probably win didn't because they either ran a little slower because they got nervous or expended too much energy at the beginning because they were anxious and kind of, you know, used up all their energy from that adrenaline. Um, 
Again, thinking about the timer, right? The person doing the timing um, can accidentally hit the button, but guess the right answer of how long it took. Um, you can have a momentary lapse in concentration. Um, you can blink when the person goes across, right? Um, and just thinking about the reaction time of the player, right? So part of it is your time off the line. So they talk about this a lot in um, track, but in particular in swimming, like they have measurements of how fast people get off the blocks and into the pool. And that, you know, every little tenth of a second can count, especially in a, a race like the 50 meter, right? Where you go through one length of the pool. Um, you know, you're slow off the blocks, you probably already lost the race, right? If you're doing like a Katie Ledecky 800, right? Probably not gonna affect you quite as much. Um, so that can also affect it as well, right? Uh, if that person's really motivated to do well, right? There's a lot at stake. You're gonna get an NFL contract with millions of dollars potentially. You might do really good off that block, even though you're not typically, right? Um, actually, here's another nice example of this. Um, I'm just going through Twitter yesterday. Uh, I am part of the Gymtronet, which is the, gym, the gymnastics Twitter. I never did gymnastics, but I love to watch it. And someone had posted a picture or a little video of Sumi Lee's vault um, during the all around final. And like all year, her vaults had been not very good at all. But she like nailed her vault in the all around final. And they, they were like, you can't say she didn't understand the assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, if you're motivated to do well and you train yourself and peak at the right time, right? That's going to make a difference. You know, other things that aren't on here. You went out drinking the night before, right? You're competing with a kidney stone or broken ribs or the stomach flu. All those things are going to affect you as well. That certainly happened to really great athletes at really inopportune times, right? And sometimes it does well for you and you do okay. I think it was 2018, Simone Biles competed with a kidney stone at Worlds, fell twice in the all around, but still won because her scores were just so much higher, right? So you can't argue she wasn't mentally tough, right? And so the twisties that overcame her, if she just couldn't do that because she would have hurt the team or, you know, come away with a spinal cord injury and ended her career or potentially her life. So measurement error reduces reliability. Makes sense, right? The more error you have, the less, strong your reliability coefficient is going to be. It's one of those inverse relationships we talked about when we talked about correlation, right? Measurement error goes up, reliability goes down. Measurement error goes down, reliability goes up. And so here's a graph just sort of representing an example of an inverse relationship. Um, this one I kind of like, it's like, uh, this guy's frequency of social media posts and his level of employment. <laughs> so, you know, not great. <laughs> um, I think that happened to a lot of people over the pandemic who like lost their jobs or quit. It's like, I don't go on social media, right? <laughs> um, so, and he made this himself. It was <laughs> how many posts he made on, in this case, it was his blog. So, he had nothing else to do, no job. He posts a lot more often. <laughs> So how do you deal with measurement error? Well, there's a bunch of different ways we can do it, but here are the three main ways we do it when we're looking at assessment. So first we take lots of measures and average the answers. We tend to get better results when we use similar questions. The questions that are similar and so measure or assess the same let's say attitude, personality trait, type of intelligence, right? We'll give you a more reliable measure. Uh, same thing if we go back to our in-class exam, right? If I ask you multiple questions from chapter one, right? It's gonna get us a better indication of how well you knew that material from chapter one than if I just asked you one question from chapter one, right? So that gives you more reliable answers. The other thing you can do if you're designing an assessment is ask lots of kinds of people. This will give you more variety of answers. 
and less idiosyncratic answers that could affect your score. So if you only asked a couple people, right, and they happen to be just quirky people, right, then you might end up having sort of a quirky assessment that only applies to quirky people when you were trying to measure intelligence, right? It's not quirkiness. So this is why on tests like the intelligence test, the personality tests that are used as gold standards and used in research and in clinical settings, their samples of people they norm it on will be thousands and thousands of people. And they will try to make it representative of the population in terms of education level, gender, uh, racial identity, things along those lines. But for some tests, it's important to look at age, right? So for the intelligence test, for example, there are different norms for different ages. So you would have a group that would be your norm group for like 40 to 49 year olds versus 60 to 59 year olds. And then the third we've already sort of mentioned, which is that you want to use uniform testing procedures or what are just called standardized testing procedures. You don't want the scores to be affected by things such as different test environments, different instructions, right? So again, this is why tests with a lot of research about them that are going to be used in clinical settings. You read the instructions from a manual that tells you as the examiner exactly what to say and in what order. So, and you can take this to extreme. So imagine having five minutes to study a word list in a quiet room versus two minutes to study a word list in a noisy hallway, right? Like. Of course, in one condition, it's going to be better, but often it's more varied than that. And because of the uniform testing procedures and because they've asked a lot of different people, that's why these clinical tests will end up with these good uh, reliability. So if you have unreliable measures, it starts to affect what you want to do. So let's say you're doing it as research, you won't be able to show differences you want to. Essentially, it, the less reliable a measure is, the less likely it is you will find significant results because reliability affects the ability of that measure to relate to other measures or to pick up on fine-tuned differences, for example. So essentially, Measurement error makes it really hard to get results, whether you're trying to assess someone accurately in a clinical setting, give someone an, ex uh, an exam that would tell them accurately how much information they've retained from your class, or do research, right? And use the assessment on a whole bunch of different people. All righty. So there are some other theories of reliability. Um, so domain sampling model says that we have to use a small number of items to try to get at everything we could possibly measure for the construct we're looking at. It basically says domain sampling theory, let me into the model, let me flip that around. It basically says it's impossible for us to actually measure each aspect of something we're looking at, right? So if I wanted to make sure you understood every word of chapter one on the exam, I'd have to ask you so many questions. You could never finish it in the hour we have here. And, <laughs> right, you, we wouldn't have room for any of the other test questions. Sure, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so essentially the main sampling means that we're stuck having to use a small number of items to get at a large amount of information. Another example, there are probably hundreds of questions you could ask about someone's self-esteem, but the most commonly used measure of self-esteem, which is the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, you'll see it abbreviated R-S-E-S, -S, only has 10 items, and it's been used since the 60s, and like it's rare for someone to try to design a new measure of self-esteem because like this one works, so why do we need this one, right? Unless we're getting at something more fine-tuned. 
So like there's one that's like appearance self esteem. So essentially domain sampling model or domain sampling theory says like we have to only have a representation or a sample of the possible items we could ask about each topic or the fancy psych word here is domain. Item response theory is used for computerized testing. So an item response theory it is adaptive. So the GRE, how I told you how it's adaptive and you'll get part of easy questions. Um, that's an example of item response theory. There are some computerized, let's say, personality tests that are actually based on this as well. So let's say on a subscale on a longer questionnaire, there's like 10 items, but you measure the, you answer the first three items in a way that like it's estimated the rest of your scores would be the same, they save you the other seven items and you skip over them. So again, it's adapted. Items that needed to need to be responded to are, it's almost like a screening measure in some ways. And again, adaptive, it responds to your answers. So it's like, okay, we can skip the rest of it. So there's some advantages to that, right? That could be shorter to take it. The old version of the MMPI, which was 500 plus items, took about 45 minutes to an hour to take for the average college student. You know, if you can get that down to half hour, 25 minutes, right? It saves that person time. You know, they're more alert while they're taking it because they're not going to get some fatigue. Some people just like taking tests more on a computer as well. It just feels more engaging, almost like data side, right? All right, ways we can calculate reliability. There are lots of different ones here. Um, and we'll go through each of these. So you don't need to worry about scribbling down the whole list because each of these is going to get its own slide. So we'll start with test retest reliability. And this is exactly what it sounds like. You give the person the assessment or the test once, and then you give it to them again after a certain amount of time. Are the scores similar? This is also sometimes called time sampling, repeatability, or temporal consistency. So essentially, you take the same, let's say, questionnaire twice. Will you get the same score or at least a similar score? If I administer an IQ test twice, will you end up with the same IQ? If you time someone in the 40 several times, how similar are their times? Maybe they have one really good time, but then all their other times are like, mm, right? You're like, oh, that might not be representative, right? Of how well they are, how they did. Basically, you're asking, is the measure repeatable? So here's another chance where we have to think about why there might be differences at two time points, right? So it could be actual differences. So maybe if you run the 40 10 times, you're just tired by the end. Your time is slower, right? Um, or it could be to error, right? Maybe the second time you ran the 40, like a bird swooped down and all the scratches. You're like, oh, then that tells you your time. I don't know, it could happen, right? Um, and so you essentially, to measure this, you just correlate the scores at the two different times. You do have to watch for practice effects. So if you're giving someone, let's say I gave you the exam you're gonna take Monday, Monday, and then I gave it to you again on Friday. Like you might do better on Friday, not for any other, not that you have more information, but you just like know which questions to expect, right? <laughs> and so you do better because of that. Um, I won't do that, I promise you, I don't know if <laughs> The other thing with test retest reliability is sometimes you don't want it to be repeatable. So, for example, we don't necessarily want great repeatability if we're measuring things like temperature, right? Because we know there's natural fluctuation to the Earth's temperature, and if there wasn't, I don't know, maybe we would think we were in the matrix or something. I don't know, right? So, like, we'd be like, huh, right? 
Our hunger level is going to differ throughout the day. Another clear example I can think of is oftentimes when you're doing therapy with someone for something like depression, there are quick measures of depressive symptoms you can give a person before each therapy session. And if that just stayed the same, it would mean your therapy is not really working, right? So you want those to start decreasing. And if they go back up, you want to like check in with your client, what happened this week that's affecting that. But there are things that are repeatable, like reaction time, your IQ score, GRE scores tend to be pretty similar, and your personality. I mean, kind of the definition of personality is that it's consistent over time and across situations, right? So traits are these things that are repeatable that stay the same. States are those things we don't want good test for test reliability for because they're going to change based on the circumstances. Boredom, right? Some of you might be thinking this is really interesting and really engaged. Some of you might be like, oh, I could use a nap right now. <laughs> right? Uh, and that's fine. Like, fully understand there are times I'm not as exciting as others, right? Again, temperature is going to vary. Your amount of tiredness is going to vary, again, depending on how well you slept the night before, you know, did your preschooler get up three times in the night? <laughs> you had to alternate with your husband. That's never happened all last week. Um, <laughs> you know, or, you know, did you have to stay up late to study for an exam? Or as I mentioned before, like, you know, a friend needed you at three in the morning, things like that. And then again, something like hunger is going to fluctuate throughout the day. So if you didn't eat breakfast, you might be getting pretty hungry right now, right? But if you ate right before you came here, you're probably doing okay. So we only expect trait things to have good temporal consistency. We'll choose different measurement intervals depending on how trait-like something is. So again, there are times where we create a measure and like, we just don't care if the test through test reliability is that great because we don't expect it to be because we're measuring a state, right? There are specific, and in fact, y'all will give this to each other later in the semester. There are specific state measures of anxiety, for example. And you would expect that to vary much more than the trait measure of anxiety, which asks about in general, whereas the state is like, how are you right now? All right, another version, uh, I can get to this slide and then we'll pick up on Friday. Another version here is the split, or sorry, the parallel forms method. Sometimes this is called equivalent forms method. This is basically if you try to make two forms of a test. This is something I would do quite commonly when I was teaching in grad school because I'd have classes of like 90 people and they just have to sit so close together that I'd alternate who got what exam, um, essentially to try to like prevent cheating. Um, so you're measuring the same attribute with two versions of the same test, basically. This is not used very often simply because it's difficult enough to get one good version of an assessment, much less to develop two. Uh, but it is very rigorous. It's a good way to measure reliability, but it's often not practical. That being said, one of the measures you'll give each other later in the semester is the repeatable, oh, I'm going to forget the acronym now, but it's a repeatable measure of neuropsychological symptoms, essentially. And so there are actually three versions of the assessment so that you can repeat it and see how someone is doing over time. Alrighty, I will see you on Friday. We'll finish up this lecture and I'll leave some time for questions for the exam. So please bring questions.